on I-24 on their way here. Uh, so welcome. We're glad you're here. Um, this is Internal Medicine Grand Rounds, and our speaker today is Dr. Brian Johnson. A um, little background information. He is, uh, is a graduate of Mercer and then went to residency at ETSU at Family Practice. Uh, so there's some ETSU people here, Brian Mark. Um, and myself. I spent uh, uh, 12 years in private practice in Hiawassee, Georgia, and has board certifications in family palliative and integrative medicine. Um, he's here as a, in a role of the medical chief medical officer for Aspire Health Chattanooga, and we're glad that he's here to s speak to us. I think one of the things that Dr. Johnson grasps, and I would challenge him maybe to speak to this, would be the percentage of medical care which is reducible to modifiable biochemistry. My sense of it is that it's about 25 percent, 25 to 50 percent, um, and a lot of the rest of it is taking care of a person in their context. And so um, I appreciate what he brings to our department, and I think um, this is going to be a really helpful grand rounds for us. So, Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Mike. So good morning, everyone. Uh, it's okay? Volume's good for this? because I move. Can everyone hear me? This is okay. So those of you know, who know me know I wouldn't be me unless I had my green tea. So I'll be sipping this throughout. Feel free to sip what you sip throughout. Um, truly glad to be here this morning. Glad I'm not on 24. So what do you feel? Somebody out loud, tell us, danger. danger. Thank you, thank you, Jonathan. Somebody else, what do, you, what do you feel? Sad, good. What else do you feel? Stuck. Oh, nice. What else? No one else feels anything? Confused. Confused, disappointed? Yeah. Excellent. It's a really interesting picture, isn't it? So now imagine with me that you're the dude and everything else in the picture represents a day in the life of your clinical practice. Now what are you feeling? If anything different, stuck, confused, frustrated. Anybody else feeling something now as you think about that represents me in my clinical practice? I can't help but feel, you know, a little isolated, a little lonely. I'm intrigued. I'm also feeling a little overwhelmed. But invariably, I also feel fragmented. As I think about me and my clinical day, Maybe I feel a little disconnected from something, right? Um, and that's really the idea here, is, is to get at that feeling. If you've ever felt that about your clinical practice, in fact, now call to mind a day in your life where you spent a fair amount of your day with serious or chronically ill folks. Saw two or three that day. Maybe you saw 10 or 12 that week. Really seriously ill folks who had a lot going on. Uh, pain, sickness, finances, social, psychological, really a lot going on with these folks. Invariably, I come out of those rooms feeling a lot like this, feeling like there was a lot going on. I'm not sure what was real and what was a reflection, and, and maybe all I had was a buckskin canoe, right, to try and navigate how seriously ill they were. So originally the talk was palliative care for the generalist. That doesn't get at what I actually want to talk with you about today. What I really would like to talk to you about um, is the tension that exists in that space of serious and chronic illness. So I decided to rename your talk, this talk, the answer to all your problems. <laughs> and hopefully at the end you'll feel more like, oops, you'll feel more like that. Wouldn't you like to feel more like that at the end of your day? Come out of an encounter with a chronically ill patient and feel a lot more like that? I would too. But it's what I have to say today is probably not the answer to all your problems. 
Now, I debated about this next slide, and I have a bet going with myself to see if I actually do it. So, here we go. What if the problem is not the problem? What if the problem is your attitude about the problem? Savvy? So I, I, I won the bet with myself that I would actually do my Captain Jack Sparrow imitation. But I'm not sure that there really is a problem, that, that disconnect, that tension that we felt. I would say it really is more of a tension, and here's how I would describe it. I would say that it is an awareness of a disconnect between the science, the technology, the skill set of medicine, and the purpose of medicine. And I would say it's not really our attitude. It's really more a, a mindset. And it's a mindset about what is the purpose of medicine in the first place. And uh, believe it or not, I did not talk with Dr. Davis before. His comments before were purely his own, but that's exactly what I'm going to talk about today, is this mindset around the purpose of medicine. Now, we could probably talk about that at length, the purpose of medicine, but I submit for your contention today that other people have thought about it long and hard, and some of them have written some really amazing works, including this one. If you haven't ever read this book, I implore you, challenge you, I dare you, yep, I double-dog dare you, to get this book and read it. Eric Cassell is a tenured senior faculty at University of Cornell Medical School, and he is attending at uh, New York uh, Presbyterian Hospital. He wrote this originally in 91, again in 2004. And look, the goal of medicine, the nature of suffering and the goals of medicine, the purpose of medicine, the heartbeat of medicine, the point of medicine. Essentially, and this will not actually spoil the book for you, because there's a lot of reading in this book, but essentially he drives home this point, that the purpose or the goal of medicine is to help a suffering person suffer less. That's it. And I think that's where we find the tension this disconnect between the skill set, the technology, the science, the things I'm, the volume that I need to master, and this awareness that there's this suffering person in the room with me. And what did I do in my little buckskin canoe to, to make, to bridge that gap? I suggest to you that as you change your mindset about palliative care, which is what we're going to try to do today, if you change your mindset about palliative care and what it is and how to deploy it and what your role is in it, you can go a long way towards bridging that disconnect in your own life and finding a whole lot more meaning and value in your own daily clinical practice. So I mentioned there's some people who thought about this long and hard. There's another guy who thought about this a long time ago. I'll let you read that while I sip my green tea. Now this guy's really old. He hadn't, didn't do any RCTs didn't have any financial endorsements. This is not an actual picture of him, it's a drawing, we think, of a fellow named Hippocrates. Whoa. <laughs> this idea was prevalent way back then. By the way, there's a quote uh, typically attributed to Osler. Osler got it from Hippocrates. It says, it's oftentimes more helpful to know what sort of person has the illness than what sort of illness the person has. So, I decided to rename the talk Palliative Care for Everyone. And I mean every clinician and every patient who really would benefit from a mindset around helping a suffering person suffer less. So Palliative Care for Everyone. I'm going to try to demonstrate that to you. It's really about focusing on quality of life during a serious illness. So that the science, the technology, the skill set is oftentimes focusing on curative intent, making the violence of the disease less, right? Whereas the mindset of palliative care is really about quality of life during a serious illness. Focusing on their quality of life, helping a suffering person suffer less. And here are the people we're talking about. And so everyone would deserve a clinician who's thinking about helping them suffer less, right? When it's your child who may or may not have a nursemaid's elbow, you're hoping the pediatrician is also interested in helping your child suffer less hoping they're interested in the parent suffering less. But we're talking today really about serious and chronic illness, and here's the list. Now, the good news is, is that there's only 5% of the people in our country who have these. The other 95% of us do not suffer from these. Only 5% have these illnesses at these stages. <laughs> the bad news is we spend 
50% of everything we do every day, all day, all year, on those 5% of people. Every phone call, every prescription, every appointment, every hospitalization, every research dollar, every hospital bed, half of everything we do every day, all day in medicine, we do for 5% of our population that has one or more of these chronic illnesses. So trying to figure out how to help these suffering people suffer less is really important. The first mindset change then is to realize that there is such a thing as primary pulmonary care, right? We are, you're learning basic pulmonology, you're learning basic cardiology, there's basic infectious disease, Mike. And we all expect all of our colleagues to have gained that basic primary information in infectious disease, and Mike is expecting you to apply that basic primary education in infectious disease. Well, there are basic palliative care skills. This is uh, a snippet from an article by Abernathy and Quill, both former presidents of the National Academy, 2013, New England Journal of Medicine. And you can see it talks about primary palliative care and specialty palliative care. So let me pull out the primary palliative care part for you because you're not specialty palliative care providers, but you are primary care providers. And I suggest to you that this skill set is something you need to acquire and you need to deploy because primary palliative care is really the way we're going to address that cohort of really suffering people. But I'll make it even easier for you. It's really about a triple focus. It's a mindset that you bring when you're in a room with a seriously or chronically ill person. And you're focusing on alleviation, prognostication, and communication. Right? This is your triple focus. This is what you're always thinking about. And here's why. Because a suffering person usually has a symptom that they're focused on. They usually have some uncertainty that's really driving a lot of their thinking, feeling, and doing. And they probably have not been communicated well with or have not communicated well with you. So these are the three things you're going to try to do to help a suffering person suffer less as you think about primary palliative care. Most of the rest of the talk is going to sort of generally lay out what that skill set would be. I'm not going to go into a, a lot of detail around how you acquire it because that's part of your routine training, but I'll give you some tidbits that will help you. I also tried to give you a cool little thing to help you remember as you're out there in your buckskin canoe and you're facing this serious and chronic illness and this fragmentation and the reflection of am I really doing what I'm supposed to do and what did it all mean. So your sacred triangle is going to help you focus on the quality of life during serious illness and it's going to deploy those three points. And they're sort of always moving, right? You're always moving back and forth in these three arenas. In symptom alleviation, we're really talking about suffering, right? And that's the goal of medicine is to help a suffering person suffer less. But what exactly is suffering, right? Well, that's a good question. There are probably lots of definitions. Back to Cassell's book, he says that suffering, any time that you feel that the intactness of your personhood is threatened. We'll flash that out in just a minute. You're suffering. So you think about these people who are dealing with these serious and chronic illnesses every day, all day. The intactness of their personhood feels threatened and they are suffering. But one of the important things to remember is, this is also from Cassell, bodies don't suffer. Persons suffer. So in your basic skill set of primary palliative care, you've got to make a choice to start to become aware of the other person. Right? You're a person, they're a person, because persons suffer, bodies don't suffer. These are the most prevalent symptoms in this order. Right? People with serious chronic illness, this is what they report that they suffer in this order. You'll be glad to know that both uh, the national, the AAFP and the ACP have published guidelines on the website for the top three and even some for dyspnea, stepwise guidelines about what you do about this. So if you really would like to know what are the most basic skills that my academy thinks I should have as I think about those top three or four symptoms, they're on your academy's website. Guidelines around what to do about them clinically, how to apply the science, the technology, and the skills that you have. But let me show you a slide that shows you the median reported presence of those symptoms by the people suffering those one or more chronic illnesses. I'll just take a gander at that. I mean, there's only two or three below 50 percent. Uh, most of the others are north of 50, several are north of 70. Every day, all day. Right? People with those illnesses 
report that they have these symptoms at that frequency most days, most all day long. Now think about that for a minute. Think if you were nauseous for 10 days in a row. Think if you were short of breath, 10 days in a row, unremitting. Think if you were dog tired. Well, you are dog tired. Think if that went on for 10 days in a row with no end in sight. You would be suffering. Your person would be suffering, right? So what are we gonna do about that? I told you I'm just going to do the high points. So there's not any super mysterious thing I'm about to reveal to you, so just relax. These are just a little overview of the symptoms. But I will give you a nugget around pain. But you remember the official guidelines. The CDC now has them. Your national academies have them. The federal government has them. Your state government has them. And they all essentially say the same thing. They focus on a stepwise approach, a good history, but what you may have not noticed, unless you spent time reading the several hundred pages of the CDC document, yikes, is that, and, and you're going to like this part. So if I lost you, tune back in. You really are going to like this part because who doesn't tell you that they're in pain? So the goal of treating pain is not to make the pain go away. That's actually in the guidelines. The goal of treating pain is to ask the patient this, what would you do if you hurt less. The goal of treating pain is to restore function. So in your pain assessment, the guidelines say, you're supposed to say, Timmy, what can't you do because of the pain? And he's gonna say, I can't go square dancing with Sally. And you're gonna say, great. I'm gonna put you on this lower tab for two weeks, you're gonna come back, and we're gonna see whether or not you went square dancing with Sally. This is in the guidelines. And if he comes back and says, didn't change a bit, couldn't go square dancing with Sally, you can either try to escalate the dose or you can say, great, I'm glad that medicine, we know it didn't work for you, let's don't use opiates anymore because it didn't improve your function, right? I told you we were going to like that, right? It gives you an absolute out. If what you're doing around the therapy you're doing is not changing their function, if they can't do something that they couldn't do before, you can stop that therapy according to the guidelines. Yay! No argument, those are the guidelines. Yay! Remember non-pharmacological approaches, physical therapy, exercise, other things you can do. Remember non-opiates, tricyclics and anticonvulsants and COX-2s. I know you have to consider things, cardiac and all that sort of stuff, but COX-2s are really way more friendly than non-steroidals and COX-2s really help. They at least help you get an idea of is this pain musculoskeletal, is this pain a chronic inflammatory type pain. I may change after 10 days, two weeks on a COX-2, but they can really be helpful in reducing pain and, and helping you figure out what's going on. Anxiety and depression, there are also standard guidelines for that. I mentioned your Academy's website, it'll tell you how to assess and standardize and categorize. But social work counseling and cognitive behavioral therapy really do help. They make a much bigger difference than a lot of other things do because a lot of these people have things going on that are not tied to their actual dis-ease. Right? Biofeedback and mindfulness-based stress reduction, MBSR was pioneered by John Kabat-Zinn in New York 20 years ago. It's now paid for by Medicare. You can actually order a mindfulness-based stress reduction curriculum for your patient and Medicare will pay for it. Chaplaincy is always a good thing because a lot of times people are suffering in the setting of these serious and chronic illnesses is unmet spiritual needs. The truth is they know that they are fading. The truth is they know they are beginning the dying part of their life journey. And that's you when we start getting really interested in what happens next. Chaplaincy can help you. Fatigue. Fatigue is about energy. Fatigue is about energy. Energy is about mitochondria. The whole reason that you breathe and eat is to get an oxygen atom and a piece of a cheeseburger down to the mitochondria so that he can pass that oxygen, so he can pass that cheeseburger along the electron transport chain, make you some ATP, put the waste products in the oxygen, and ship it out. That's it. That is why you eat and breathe, is to get that mitochondria some ability to make energy. So fatigue is always about energy. So always talk about sleep, because if people are not sleeping, they are not living well, period. When you don't sleep, you suffer. And it has nothing to do with you having heart failure or stage four cancer. It just stinks to not sleep, because it deprives you of energy, right? Energy is, is also about movement. Like begets like. Study after study in various chronic illnesses has demonstrated that moderate exercise, 20 minutes twice a day, preferably weight bearing. So that means you know a can of Lipton soup and going for a walk around the house for 20 minutes counts. 
as exercise over time and a, a period of weeks that actually improves people's sense of fatigue those suffering with serious and chronic illnesses I know your COPDers they can't even get out of their wheelchair I get that we'll come up with some different strategies for them but stage 4 cancer heart failure renal failure other chronic conditions responds to exercise their fatigue improves with exercise and when people are less tired they feel better suffering people suffer less when they don't feel as tired and then you got to focus on nutrition right fatigue is about energy are you sleeping are you moving are you eating something good are you eating it all are you eating junk what are you putting in there garbage in garbage out are you putting anything in there I would recommend not cheeseburgers on the other hand you know maybe soy chocolate milk dyspnea again these are their guidelines on, in your academy blow by air is as or more effective than oxygen a fan blowing on your COPD or makes them feel less smothery than oxygen going in their nose makes them feel less smothery right so blow by air helps your people who tell you all the time I just I feel smothery well put a fan on them all the time you I mean we walk into rooms and see the fan blowing we go oh good <laughs> I already know they feel better with the fan blowing on them I'm ha have a better conversation counseling helps those who struggle with dyspnea all the time you know, breathing techniques exercising around uh, cognitive behavioral therapy around their thought process around the anxiety that triggers it exercise does help dyspnea if they're able to exercise at all biofeedback helps them here is a medicine pearl that may or may not be helpful to you but this is in a lot of guidelines that you may or may not have read and when you see it you may be scared of it which is why I'm putting up here to let you know that in your basic primary palliative care role you don't have to be scared of this okay in an opiate naive dyspneic patient COPD or heart failure person this helps a lot and it's a tiny little bit we're talking about you know two to four milligrams of morphine routinely I see this help Timmy he can take this about 30 minutes later he can get in the car with Sally they can go to square dancing and he can actually do something at square dancing he can chat he can participate he can run the music play the violin he can take another dose while he's at square dancing a little drop under his tongue the good news is that the elixir has a uh, pharmacokinetics not too dissimilar from IV so within four or five minutes they're experiencing relief of their anxiety their sense of breathlessness their sense of fatigue their sense of overwhelmed it really does something for them and then they can come home and three weeks later when they come back to the office you can say Tim did you go square dancing with Sally he can say well I didn't actually get out on the dance floor but I got in the car which was a huge because I, I never left the house I went I talked to Bob while he ran the music we had a great time I took another drop I came home doc it was fabulous so in your opiate naive patients who are struggling with COPD that is the recommended place where you start it works don't be scared of it if you are scared of it call me and I'll tell you not to be scared of it um, anorexia is difficult to tackle but it's a lot about energy it's about uh, exercise is about movement you tell them to eat small meals you, you get them to a nutritionist who can explain what a small meal is and how to graze all day rather than try to eat large meals you try to make sure they're focusing on dense calories here's a real basic thing I typically recommend peanut butter cream cheese ice cream and if you're gonna put a spoonful of something in your mouth you want it to have as many calories in there as you possibly can if anorexia is a problem exercise helps anorexia and there's lots of things in pharmacy to help anorexia and they're beyond the scope of what we want to talk about today insomnia is a big deal insomnia is a hard thing to tackle insomnia is uh, often misunderstood uh, Jonathan will tell you that insomnia has to be three months of major sleep disturbance before it can be categorized as insomnia most of what we deal with probably has to do with uh oh to do with more of a sleep disturbance um, a chronic sleep disturbance CBT has better evidence than every pill the reason that most of your chronic illness people are not sleeping has nothing to do with some serotonin deficiency it has to do with a soul deficiency right so CBT works for your patients with insomnia works better than pharmacy sleep hygiene which you if you don't know about you should teach yourself about sleep hygiene sleep hygiene is very real here's my absolute fast sleep hygiene that most patients connect with here's what you get to do in bed you get to sleep and smooch and that's it if you're not sleeping or smooching it doesn't happen in bed 
Now, if you want to read, watch TV, eat a cheeseburger, you can sit in the chair next to the bed, but you cannot be in the bed. You can sleep and smooch in bed, and that's it. Diet, you want to try to get all the stimulants out, right? You want to find out what their expectations are about sleep, because they may have a very unrealistic idea of what sleep means, what sleep looks like. They've been a shift worker all their lives, right? You need, that's, that's a little in-office CBT. And then if you're going to use pharmacy, take the time to look up one that says that it helps induce normal sleep architecture. Avoid the ones that don't induce normal sleep architecture, and here's why. <laughs> If you actually want to feel rested the next day, you've got to get to stage four one and a half times. If you don't get to stage four, normal sleep architecture one and a half times, you don't feel rested the next day. That's why your sleep apnea patients say, I feel exhausted when I wake up the next day because they never got to stage four. So, I'm going to come back to that later. Prognostication. Oh, prognostication. Yeah, I know. We're all scared of prognostication. But I'm going to try to help calm your tension around that a little bit. Prognostication is not about fortune-telling, forecasting, crystal ball reading. Prognostication is about helping a suffering person suffer less who is suffering with the thing which we, we all suffer, which is uncertainty. Right? And there is a lot of uncertainty when we're talking about serious and chronic illness. But there are some things that are much more certain than others. But when you are feeling a sense of uncertainty, is the loan going to come through? Is the pregnancy going to go to term? Is the bill going to get paid? Am I going to get that uh, fellowship that I'm hoping to get? The actual one, not the second one, the actual one I'm hoping to get. When you have that sense of uncertainty, if somebody had some prognostic information about that, you would want to know. You might not, you might take it with a grain of salt, but you would definitely want to know. So prognostication is really a pretty simple idea. It is about what to expect. It's about what to expect. Feel free to sip your beverage. So, what can you expect? That is not prognostication. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> Even if that's what you expect, don't do that. That's not prognostication. These are the folks we're talking about, right? People with one or more of these illnesses, most of them, the vast majority, 80 plus percent of people who have these conditions are over the age of 65, right? So, here's what you can expect from the combined survival literature in this group of patients. If I lost you, pay attention, this will help you. You can expect 50% of those people to be dead in five years. Half of them will be gone in five years, guaranteed. You can expect a person who has one or more of those chronic illnesses, typically over the age of 65, you can expect an 85% chance of them to be dead in any two-year span. And none of them, all of them, have just about a 0% chance of being better, health, living more vigorously two years from now. That's what you can expect. So as a primary palliative care provider, this is a, a mindset you need to cultivate. When I see people who have one or more of the illnesses on that list, this is what I should expect to happen over the next five years. So maybe I better start talking about what I expect to happen or what they expect to happen at least, right? So when you see folks in those categories, here are three big clues that we are really nearing the end of their journey. And your mindset might need to shift from primary palliative care to specialty palliative care or maybe even hospice. There's increasing utilization of healthcare resources, which is a fancy way of saying bounce back, readmit, fourth admission in four months for a similar or related diagnosis, increasing utilization of healthcare resources, 19 visits to the ER for COTB exacerbation this year, increasing utilization of healthcare resources. They have unintended weight loss, invariably, because they have anorexia, because they have fatigue, because it's about energy, because they are actually beginning to die, they are losing weight. 10% total body weight loss in any given span is the definition of cachexia. And it is a major marker of a poor prognosis. And a decline in their performance status. Those of you who know me at all know that I spend a lot of time camping out on this. And that is because this is the most validated metric in the literature around predicting morbidity and mortality. 
A lot of the data came out of Victoria Hospice in Canada in the setting of cancer patients 20 years ago. It's been validated worldwide in that population since repeatedly. It's also been extrapolated to heart failure, dementia, renal failure, a couple of others, and it correlates almost one-to-one. -one. COPD is a little different because, uh, you know, as Carson will tell you, as we all know, how in the world that person with no lungs is still living is beyond me. I mean, you're sitting there watching them not breathe. You're not moving any air at all, and yet you're still here. You were here a month ago. How can that be? I don't know. But COPDers do tend to outlive the functional status. However, if you have one or more of those other chronic illnesses, particularly if you have stage four cancer. So the hard data I'm about to show you came out of cancer, but it's very extrapolatable, if that's a real word, to other serious and chronic illnesses. I think this next slide is very busy. Don't panic. I'm going to explain it. Ah, there it is. It's terribly busy. Don't panic. Notice that it goes from zero to 100. It has five categories, ambulation, activity, self-care, intake, and consciousness. We're going to pull out 30 to 40 percent. When your PPS is 30 to 40 percent, here's what it looks like. Here's what the patient looks like in the chair. You're talking to this human being. You're talking to their significant other. If their PPS is somewhere between 30 and 40 percent, and they have one or more of those chronic illnesses, this is what the human being is doing. This is what the person looks like on a daily basis. They are mostly sitting or lying, right? They probably needed help to get out of the bed to their wheelchair, but then they take the wheelchair to the recliner or the sofa. They stay there until somebody helps them back into the wheelchair or the recliner, or they go to the bathroom. They help them transfer to the potty, back off the potty. They may transfer back off the potty by themselves, but it's a little sketchy. And then they come back to the bed or the chair, and that is their day. They do not help fold clothes. They do not wash the dishes. They certainly don't mow the lawn. They don't vacuum the house. They, they cannot do any real work or housework. Not that housework is not real work. Woo, sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to think. It actually says regular work, hobby, or housework is actually what it says under work. Housework is real work. Um, they have a markedly reduced intake. Yeah, don't tell my wife I said that. Because she'll think, now, you tell me that you believe this, because I really do. And their consciousness is normal or reduced. If you have a person who has one or more of those serious chronic illnesses, remember this is prognostication. This is trying to help get a little certainty around uncertainty. At a primary palliative care level, your mindset needs to be an intention to help a suffering person suffer less when they're facing the uncertainty of their prognostication. I'm not talking about saying, Ricky, you have five minutes to live. I'm talking about developing your own prognostic awareness. What do I really expect to happen in this seriously or chronically ill person? If they look like this, here's what you can expect. This is their mortality at six months and their survival in days and medians. They have a 90% chance of all-cause mortality in the next six months. Nine out of ten people with a PPS of that with one or more of those chronic illnesses will be dead in the next six months from everything. Right, it's because they have no margin at all. If they get an infection, if they're in a car wreck, if they fall down the stairs, if they have a stroke, if their cancer comes back, if the medicine reacts on them, it takes them out. They have no reserve. But look at the survival in days. PPS of 40%. Remember, this is the hard data came out of cancer, but it's very applicable to other serious and chronic illnesses. Two different medians. The, in between, 25 days. Half of the people with one or more of those serious chronic illnesses, you can expect to have all-cause mortality in the next 25 days. Which is why uh, Christakis has demonstrated repeatedly in the literature that the average clinician overestimates survival by a factor of five 90% of the time. Dr. Hofstetter, how long would this person live? Six months. 90% of the time that person's dead in one month. And this is why. Because we just don't connect the dots around what we should actually expect to happen. So communication is a big deal. Communication is really about active listening. I'm happy to tell you, we're going to go over some slides here. Good, I have plenty of time. And I'm going to touch on some high points. I'm going to try to give you some pearls that could be immediately useful for you because I want you to be good primary palliative care practitioners because I want you to help a suffering person suffer less today. But I hope in the very near future at Erlanger to be on point for a communication curriculum here where you can actually take a class to learn how to communicate better around some of the topics we'll talk about. And you can actually get credentialed 
certified at the end of that class as having gotten certified that you have these communication skills. And I can tell you that in the future job market, people are looking for that. Okay? Also help your marriage. Like, don't tell your wife that housework is not work. So just enjoy the illustration for a minute. Just kind of kind of dig on that and ask yourself, is that me, you know, talking to my colleague, to my patient? Or is that me? And that's the patient or my colleague trying to talk to me somewhere. But this is a quote by George Bernard Shaw, a playwright, and it says, the biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it has taken place. All right, so communication requires an intention to really make sure that we're talking. It's really about active listening. Here's one of my favorite quotes about active listening. Oops. So if you really want to be in a meaningful conversation with anyone, you have to be willing for that other person to change you. Otherwise, you're not actually listening. So, typically when we think of communication in the setting of primary palliative care, we're thinking about three primary conversations that we're asking you to have. A skill set we're asking you to acquire and deploy so you can help a suffering person suffer less. A goals of care conversation, an advanced care plan discussion, and breaking bad news, also called difficult conversations. So, I'm going to hit some high points on this. They'll be helpful for you, but I promise, I hope to have an entire course on this that you can enroll. It takes place over about six months. You come for several classes, and you can do a really deep dive into this. In the meantime, here are some resources for you. Anthony Back is a nationally recognized specialty palliative care physician. He has a whole world called vitaltalk.com, which is solely about helping clinicians learn how to communicate in difficult scenarios better. And you can go to his website. I think you can sign up. And there are modules you can go through. There are uh, taped uh, role playing that you can observe. And you can really acquire a lot of things. The conversationproject.org is also a, is a good resource. It can give you some handouts. It can handouts for your patients. So those are good resources for you until you can take the class in li and live in person, which I hope you will have the chance to do. Here's something you'll find on Back's uh, website. Tips around how to communicate better. Let me just go over these pretty quickly. Signposting is simply letting the, your conversation partner know that there's something's changing, right? It can be as simple as, hey, can I put something else on our agenda today? Bing, there you go. That was signposting. They're, they now know something new's coming at me. Normalizing is a statement like, this is something I talk with everyone about. That helps reduce tension, helps them feel like, oh, I'm not being singled out. Something's not really scary wrong with me. This is a conversation Jessica has with everybody. So normalizing is a technique that you use. Permission is one of my favorites. Asking someone, is it okay if I talk with you about this? And here's why. Permission does at least two things. Permission sends a message to your conversation partner that we're on equal ground, right? And your patients like that. Your spouse likes that. People like to feel like they're on equal ground with you. And when you ask permission, it sends a message. Hey, we're equals. The other thing it does, if you haven't noticed, human beings, all human beings, including you and me, are control freaks. And when you ask somebody's permission, you're actually giving them a sense that they're controlling something. And when people have a feeling that they are controlling something, even if they're dead wrong, they are way more likely to take a risk particularly a risk of having a difficult conversation, right? So permission is one of the, my favorite things I do. If you notice that your conversation partner is getting uneasy, sending you nonverbal cues, that's your cue to slow down. That is probably as far as you're going to get today in this conversation. Relax. That's okay. It is really okay to slow down, even stop right there as you start to get feedback from this patient. Pairing is a terrific technique, pairing hope and concern, hope and worry. Gosh, I hope for that miracle too, Patrick. I'm concerned that maybe the therapy won't work or maybe, you know, Dr. Ku won't show up and do the procedure today and then that, man, we've missed our chance. Here's a tip. If I lost you, tune back in. If you're going to pair hope and worry, it's very, very powerful, but what you must not do is use a conjunction between the two. If you say, Alex, I really hope the chemotherapy works for you, but I'm concerned that it won't because, after all, you look bad, bro. Studies have shown that if you put the butt in there, our instinct, our brain mechanism, 
completely discounts the first hopeful statement and focuses only on the negative statement. So what you have to learn to do is put a period there. So say it this way, Alex, I'm hopeful also that that chemotherapy will work, period. My concern is, if it doesn't, what will we do then? Right, so if you're gonna pair hope and worry, don't use a conjunction, use a period. And then what if is a terrific technique to locate something in the future, because psychologically, Jonathan will tell you, psychologically, what that does is decompress the moment. So I'm sure you've heard him often ask, hypothetically, if. Well, suppose we did. What might it look like if, right? When you position it somewhere else than right here, right now, people are way more likely to take a risk and consider something that's scary to them. This is basic palliative care. This, this is a mindset and a skill set you need to acquire. Advanced care planning, I think the whole thing pops up. This is a definition from CAPSI. I modified it a little bit. I'm gonna break it down for you. This is the mindset you need to have when you're gonna have an advanced care plan discussion with someone. Ready? It is beginning, not concluding. Your intention is to begin, not resolve this conversation. To think, not decide, with, not for, the patient and their surrogate, you need that important stakeholder present, not alone, about their future, not their current health care plans in a non-threatening way. That's the mindset you need to have if you're going to have a fruitful advanced care plan discussion. Studies have shown that if you get them to fill out their DNR form in your office, it almost never translates to what happens the next day when they're in exacerbation in the ICU. Suddenly they want everything done. It has no legs. If, however, you have a meaningful advanced care plan conversation, if you have three of them, three advanced care plan conversations, which is why we are beginning, not concluding, three advanced care plan conversations over time before you even think about documentation. By the way, that is why the government is willing to pay you a lot of money for it and al allow you to have them repeatedly. You can have 57 of these if you want to before you have documentation, but the studies have shown it takes three conversations to produce a document that has legs that will stand up when it hits the fan. If you have three meaningful advanced care plan conversations and then fill out an advanced directive and then translate that into a pulse that when they show up at the hospital can be translated into a code status, about 85% of the time, it sticks. It lasts. They don't change their mind. We think one of the main reasons is because you've been very intentional to make sure that the surrogate and other stakeholders were present for some of those conversations and that those people were charged with having this conversation with their important people before we wrote it down. So that's the mindset around an advanced care plan discussion. The goal in an, in an advanced care plan conversation in particular, but in all of these types of primary palliative care conversations is really to leverage your relationship. You've heard me say this before. If you haven't, you'll like this. Tune in. This is true. This will help you in your marriage. Nobody makes a decision based on information. We don't. We make decisions based on relationships, period. Now, we size up the value of that information in the context of the relationship to it, it came to us, but it's really a relationship. So if you have a relationship with a patient, you're going to try to leverage it to elicit their values and goals that's going to lead to mutual understanding that will inform a shared decision making, right? This is not informed consent. Informed consent is you could die if I cut out your gallbladder, you could die if I don't sign here. That's informed consent. Shared decision making is we informed each other about what you said was valuable and I told you whether or not these care choices could help you get that value or not and then we made a decision. That's shared decision making. The down and dirty of it is this, if you're going to have an advanced care plan conversation, if you're going to have a goals of care conversation, if you're going to break bad news with somebody, here's really the goal. If I lost you, tune back in. This is, this is portable. You can use this today. The goal is to get them talking, not you. The goal is to get them talking and to ask questions that keep them talking to arrive at this. If you can't do anything else, Eric Frome uh, up at the Cleveland Clinic, a colleague of mine, has developed this, disseminated it throughout his... Uh, university, he has about a 95% completion rate of advanced care plan conversations. It's groundbreaking. He invites anyone and everyone to hijack this. So while you don't want spam in your email, if you want to be a good primary 
palliative care provider, you want to help a suffering person suffer less, particularly around these difficult conversations, you want to be a spam sender. So here's your obligatory mnemonic for your talk. S is for surrogate or speak, P is for preference, A is for assume, and M is for more to follow. So here's, how, here's what it sounds like. Oh, by the way, Ricky, this is something that I tend to talk to all of my patients about. Is it okay if I put something else on our agenda today? So I just normalized, signposted, and asked permission. Sure. I was just wondering, if we got to a place where suddenly we needed to make medical decisions and you couldn't speak for yourself, who would speak for you? And I just addressed surrogate, which is an absolute key. It is really like first base. If you don't get to surrogate, you're not going to get a meaningful advanced care plan discussion. But you just did. In what, 17 seconds? Totally decompressed it. Well, Sally speaks for me. Great. Most people choose their spouse. Say, if we were in that situation, have you already thought about what you may prefer to have done? You know, like chest compressions and uh, having your heart shocked and all of those kinds of things. No, I haven't thought about those at all. That's okay. I'll assume what most people tell me is if it was a life-saving situation, they would want everything done. Oh, you just made a friend for life. Because they don't know what that means, but they just heard a doctor say it. So it must be a real term, so it's okay. I would want everything done. I'll assume you want everything done. You're not, you're not done yet, though. Here's where you say, great, Ricky, I'll assume that you want everything done. I want you to know we're going to talk more about this later. I'm really interested in this. I'm sure you're really interested in it, too. At any point in the future that you want to talk to me more about this, I'm all ears, and I want you to know I'm going to bring this up on a regular basis until we get really clear on it. That's spam. You just did a very meaningful, very fast, evidence-based, initial advanced care plan conversation, primary palliative care. So now there's no reason for you not to do this with your seriously or chronic Ill, Ill patients. No reason. So the last one is breaking bad news. Buckner developed the six steps of uh, having a difficult conversation. This is something that I have adapted to try to make portable for me. It's a framework that can help you in breaking bad news or having a difficult conversation. It's called the Ask, Tell, Ask model. It's adapted from Buckner's six steps of, of breaking bad news. Let me encourage you, if I lost you, tune back in. Difficult conversations. You'll like this, really. Tune back in. Difficult conversations are not difficult conversations between a patient and you. They're between a patient and themselves. You're trying to help another person who is suffering around uncertainty, around illness, around fatigue, around poor communication in general, suffer less by helping them have a difficult conversation with themselves. You know why? Because just like you, they avoid those. You avoid difficult conversations with yourself too. Those are called rationalizations. You're trying to help another person have a difficult conversation with themselves, not with you. That really takes the pressure off of you as you think about going and breaking bad news or having a difficult conversation. However, you need a framework in your mind or you will get all off in the weeds with a thousand things that have nothing to do because right they're, they're, they are planning on avoiding this conversation. So you need to keep us on track. Here are some guardrails that will keep you on track. Ask, tell, ask. You ask two questions. What do you know about what's going on? What have they told you about what's going on? What do you think about what's going on? What's your idea of what's going on? You figure out where they are. What is going on? And then you ask them, how much do you want to know? How much about what I know do you want to know? How do you like to receive information? How straightforward can I be with you? So you ask them two questions. What do you know? And how much about what I know do you want to know? And how do you like it delivered? And then you tell them two things you tell them exactly what you know. I gave you some statistics on some stage four cancer with a PPS of 30%. You know something now. Now you may not be comfortable saying exactly with the firmness that I am, but you know it. And you need to find a way to tell them exactly what you know to be going on. Well, maybe it could be and the thing might show and the procedure might and the biopsy might and the thing. Mm -mm. You need to tell them what you know for sure today. And this is going to surprise you. This is part of that fractionation between the science and the purpose because we think that we're not supposed to do this but I'm telling you the evidence and the literature says this is what you should do you should tell them what you think it means and here's why 
Studies have shown that your patients do not want you deciding for them, but they desperately want to know what you as the doctor thinks it means as they incorporate that into their decision-making factor. They desperately want to know what you think it means because that's what words are all about. Words are designed to help us convey meaning to one another, right? That's what communication is about. What is the meaning in this? Which is why you got to listen to them to find out where they are in their knowledge base, where they are in their readiness, how it is they like to receive information, and then you need to communicate in a straightforward way with them. Then you need to ask them two follow-up questions. Ask, tell, ask. Ask two questions, tell two statements, ask two questions. What did you hear me say? If you don't want to end up like the girl and the boy in that picture, with the illusion that communication has taken place, just ask a simple question. What did you hear me say? What did you hear me say? You will be shocked at what they tell you back. You'll be like, wow, I really tried to be as clear as I could and I did not say that. I sure am glad I asked you because we were not communicating. Let me try again. Or you're sobbing, your heartbeat is 120. Mm, what was that uh, noticing? Oh, I should slow down. Maybe I should stop for the day. Okay, that's good. It's all right. What did you hear me say if you want to be sure that you are actually communicating moving this forward? And then you need to ask them, what do you need now? People usually need space now. Sometimes they need a little more information now, so I might ask them that. Do you need some more information now? Sometimes um, they need to circle back and readdress the symptom. Well, I'd really like to dig down then on this pain that's, that's really disrupting my ability to think through this. Great. A lot of times I just offer, hey, why don't we just sit with what we just talked about for 24 hours. I'll circle back tomorrow and we'll do some other things. I mentioned what we do about your pain earlier in the conversation. But this is how you break bad news. This is how you have a difficult conversation. This is how, how you help any human being come to grips with some information you know to be real and relevant and bearing for them when they don't really have a framework to hear it. And it's how it keeps you out of the weeds as you're having this conversation. So, that is not how you have a breaking bad news conversation. It is not how you practice primary palliative care. Don't do this. Don't do this anymore. Don't, don't insert, there's no easy way for me to tell you this, so I'm sending you to Johnson, he will. Don't put that in, don't do that anymore. But I know a guy who will, he'll be by around 3.30. You're recognizing me as green tea. He loves to talk about this stuff. Don't do that anymore. Don't send them to somebody who will, you do this. You know how, you're gonna be able to take a class out. So here's part of the reason around primary palliative care being a real set of medicine that you really need to have and you really need to work at. Because for every one cardiologist, there's one cardiologist for every 71 acute MIs happening in the country right now. One cardiologist for every 71 heart attacks happening right now. There's one oncologist for every 141 newly diagnosed cancer patients right now. It's woefully inadequate, right? By the way, by 2035, there's going to be 40% more adults with cancer and 40% less board-certified oncologists. That's the current trend. There's one specialty palliative care, one Johnson, for every 1,200 patients with serious or chronic illness. And remember, those are the people that we spend half of everything we spend on them. So the only possible way we can scale helping those suffering people suffer less is for there to be meaningful primary palliative care. That's you. And you've got to change your mindset about it. You've got to come to understand that it is an attitude you bring around focusing on helping a suffering person suffer less while I'm also mastering the skills, the technology, the techniques. Burnout rate, now this is just fun facts for you to know. Well, they may not be fun facts for you to know, but they're facts that you might find interesting. The burnout rate in internal medicine is 20 to 23 percent, which means that general internal medicine doc left the practice of general internal medicine because they got burned out. The burnout rate for oncologists is about 45 percent. That's how you get to that trend in 2035 of 40 percent less oncologists than we have now. And the burnout rate for palliative care doctors is 62 percent. It's part of the reason that there's only one for 1,200. By the way, 10,000 new Medicare recipients enroll every day. 3.65 million new people over the age of 65 emerge in our population every day, and that trend is going to continue for the next 15 years. 
There's no possible way that we can scale addressing the suffering of serious and chronic illness unless you change your mindset around what palliative care is, what palliative care means, when you apply it, who it's applicable for, and how you do it at a primary care level. But here's the real secret in the sauce. Here's what's in it for you. Burnout is, at its essence, a loss of a sense of meaning. And that guy in that boat, what, what's the meaning of this? How, how do I even begin to connect these fragments? Where, which, which is more real? This glass I'm stepping out onto, is it even glass? Or is the, is the water? What, what do I really have to navigate this? Where's my sense of meaning in this? Believe it or not, when you lean into that space of a suffering person, when you actually think about how can I alleviate a symptom, how can I help them understand their prognosis, how can I communicate better with them, what you're actually doing is finding and connecting with your own meaning in your practice of medicine. It is the number one way to prevent burnout. It is what resiliency is about. It's about meaning. So, your sacred triangle is how you're going to make this portable. You're seeing a person with one or more of those chronic illnesses, you're going to be thinking about, I need to focus on quality of life during a serious illness as well as some of these curative modalities. And I'm going to think about alleviation, prognostication, and communication because the goal of medicine is to help a suffering person suffer less. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Uh, I think we maybe have time for one or two questions for the floor. We have a burning question. Can I just make a statement? Yes. That Erlinger employs, if anyone wasn't aware, the only um, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia certified PhD in Chattanooga. Dr. Chuck Schnickel, he's up on the 10th floor in behavioral health. So if you have a patient that has insomnia and you'd like to try behavioral methods first, which is recommended for the front line, first line treatment for insomnia, you'll take that up. Hooray! So an actual resource right here in the building for your insomniacs, which is everybody. Probably everybody in this room. Yeah, yeah. Um, you just have sleep disturbance. Yours will go away when the stimulus is removed, we hope. Can I ask a question, a question yes. about EPS? Uh, yes. In inpatients? Mm. Is there a time, because we don't see people at the same yep. stage of their yep. illness, what's the time frame that you need to... So, good question. The idea then is, is there a meaningful difference between pre-morbid, which means in my space inside the acute care setting, current morbid and post-morbid, and there is a relationship. But what you need to do in that framework is go on the person you see in front of you, because you don't know what's going to happen. And you don't know, really, they were that functional before? I don't think this guy, two days ago, was mowing the yard. I don't, yeah, I don't think that was really happening. So, I believe that it really was, but the guy I see today, his PPS tapers out of this, which is why it's a useful metric for tracking during the hospitalization. If you watch their PPS get better, then it becomes a positive prognostic factor. I routinely tell people, listen, your performance status is actually the single most powerful predictor of how you're going to do. How a person is doing is a way better indicator of how they're likely to do than anything else we know of. So you go with their current PPS score. Okay. You, you know, emotionally factor in what they said their pre-morbid was, and you try to help anticipate based on their progress through PT and rehab what's a trajectory that it looks like we're getting on. But it remains valid for you in that entire setting. Anyone else? Right, I'm going to take one more question then. Oh, good. You, you said we should say what we think it means. So yes. So we'll run you through a scenario. It happens all the time in patient medicine. The patient comes in with a mass, yep. gets, a diag gets a biopsy, waits three days for path, the oncology doesn't want you to call them until they get a path specimen, yep. then they've got then they've got a diagnosis, they've got a tumor, they want you to they want to know from you what you think it means. Yep. Sometimes I'm guilty of this. I avoid saying mm -hmm. what I think their prognosis is yep. and put that into one role. So let's say it's let's say it's a brain tumor. You've mm. got a mm. uh, you've got a radiation oncologist, a neurosurgeon, a medical oncologist, and me. Yep. Um, is there is there value in telling the patient and the family what I think it means if it's likely to be different? than what my colleagues think. Absolutely. So it was a really terrific question, and it goes also to quality of life for you, because that scenario can make you suffer. Oh, boy. I, just, I feel the nausea already. Oh. Um, so there's this whole curriculum around dialogue with your colleagues and what that means. Um, however, 
You shouldn't be afraid to avoid a meaningful conversation with a patient who's asking you those questions. So if we're in Mike's scenario, and we don't know for sure yet, and everybody hasn't chimed in, maybe we haven't had a chance to talk to the team, what you can always say is, well, here's what I know about your condition. It usually ends up being more serious than not. And we have a lot left to learn, but I'm going to stick with you as we journey through this. Here's what I think it means. I think it means this is serious, and I think it means you need a team of support, and we are building that around you, and I am committed to being a stick-around part of that team. Because what you have told them is not the data, not the technical readout, the specifications of what's happening to them. You've told them the larger picture, that this is actually serious and that they're not alone, which is all anybody really wants to hear. I can tell you at the end of the day, when you ask anybody if they're facing a serious or chronic illness, they tell you they want two things and two things only. They don't want to suffer and they don't want to be alone. Right? So just by telling them, yes, I think this is serious, that reduces their suffering because they were thinking that too. And then by telling them, I'm committed to being with you, we'll sort this out, helps them not feel alone. So that's what I say usually. If they really hammer down and say, how long have I got, Doc? I say, you know what, I really should discuss this with my colleagues first. I have some thoughts on that. Let me go just check everything out. And I'll circle back later today if I can round up everybody. Right? So, no other questions? No other thoughts, comments, criticisms, cajoles? No cajoles still? You're not going to cajole me? Well, listen, thank you for your kind attention. Practice primary palliative care. <laughs>